It had been a great 2019, and 2020 was looking even better. Ramon Abbas, also known as Hashpapi, or the billionaire Gucci master, was oozing opulence. As 2020 ushered in, people all over the world were making New Year resolutions to be better individuals. But for Abbas and his conglomerate, the insatiable greed for easy money only got larger. With the system in place, Abbas texted Jumar about it. He also wanted the two of them to discuss how much money they should extort from the Qatari businessman. This time, the two were going for a big score. This would be the one final score that would set the team up financially for life. Between 5th February 2020 and 7th February 2020, Juma convinced the Qatari businessman to send a total of $299,983.58 to the Swindler's Preferred Law Firm in Kenya, Okach and Partners. The amount was transferred in multiple smaller batches over the course of the two days to prevent arousing suspicion from the banking authorities. More than half the world was celebrating Valentine's Day on February 2020. It's a day assigned to lovers, but one person wasn't feeling any love from the universe. This was the Qatari businessman. On that day that St. Valentine chose to be struck by the Cupid's arrow, the businessman had just been struck by heartbreaking news. He had been scammed. He had learned that Abdul Rahman Juma had scammed him over $1 million by pretending that he could get approval for his $16 million construction loan. Sad and angry at the same time, the Arabian businessman takes him Mr. Malik, the general manager of a Wells Fargo bank in the US. Unknown to him, the Mr. Malik he was communicating with was actually the ringleader of this den of scammers that was playing him like a puppet. Mr. Malik, real name Abbas Ramon, had learned from Sanzus the art of war. Strike the iron while it's still hot. He winged into character as the manager of a Wells Fargo bank in the US and empathized. He then promised to help the businessman. He helped him recover the money. The following day, Abbas had already rehearsed the next act. He got into character as Mr. Malik and emailed the Qatari businessman with some great news. He had just spoken to his higher contacts in the banking industry and had been assured that Juma's accounts could be frozen and the businessman could recover the $1 million that he had been scammed. However, to facilitate the recovery of the funds, the businessman had to pay $180,000 as taxes. This amount was to be paid up front. The Qatari businessman was relieved that he could recover the money that had been swindled from him by Abdul Rahman Juma. He quickly withdrew $180,000 from his business accounts and wired it to Mr. Malik from Wells Fargo. As instructed, the businessman wired $100,000 to a bank account at Capital One Bank. The remaining $80,000 was wired to TD Bank account. Unknown to him, both of these accounts were controlled by Hashpapi through Bolatito Tokalito Agagbiaka, also known as Bolamide, and other accomplices. When Hashpapi got the $180,000 from the Qatari businessman, he informed him that his $1 million frozen from Juma's accounts would be released in the coming days. 
And with that, the two friends ended the conversation with traditional gentleman pleasantries. At the end of one week, the businessman contacted Mr. Malik. He informed him that his accounts had not been funded with the $1 million that he was expecting that had been frozen from Juma's accounts. But Hashpapi, playing the role of Mr. Malik, had his script memorized. He informed the businessman that there had been a technological hitch at the bank which had made his tax payment not reflect. He ended the call by suggesting that they give the banks a little more time for the $180,000 paid to reflect in the banking systems. And then a week passed. The businessman kept checking his bank account. Nothing yet. There was no notification of any incoming wire transfers credited to his account. The businessman started getting impatient. He sent a bus pictures of wire transfer confirmation slips showing transfers of $100,000 to the Capital One bank account and $80,000 to the TD bank account. The always helpful Mr. Malik promised to expedite the matter to his superiors. But this was just part of the act. Abbas forwarded the copies of the photographs to Fashola and texted, See how we winning sees? But the billionaire Gucci master had to get the money moving. This work was urgent and will begin the following day. The money mover, Agagbiaka, purchased a cashier's check of $50,000 from the Capital One account and then deposited it to the TD bank account. Moving the money was just part of the task. The swindler also needed to pay other low-level actors that had facilitated the scam. At this stage, $15,000 will be enough to cater for the bills demanded by the accomplices. Agagbeka withdrew the cash from the Capital One bank account. Cleaning the money had to continue. The next day, 4th March 2020, Agagbeka sent a wire transfer of $50,000 from the TD bank account to one of Ashpapi's accomplices in the United Arab Emirates. The money was deposited at an account held at the Emirates NBD Bank. On 5th March 2020, the chief money cleaner withdrew 10,000 in cash from the Capital One account. As a vet in the underworld of international financial fraud, Agagbiaka had learned some lessons. You don't want to leave a huge pile of illicit cash banked in one account. Two days later, 7th March 2020, Agagbeka withdrew 7,000 from the Capital One bank account. The illicit money had to be moved fast. This routine will continue over the next few months. I have decided to follow Jesus. Hashpapi and his gang were having the time of their lives. Living life in the fast lane. Luxury cars, designer clothes, $900 desserts, and an online legion of starstruck followers. But the FBI was also patiently building its cases against the gang. Law enforcement officers watched every move that Abbas made online and followed the money trail from Nigeria to Canada, New York to North Korea. It was only a matter of time before the billionaire Gucci master would be a guest of the United States Correctional Facilities. On the night his apartment at the Palazzo Versace was raided in an operation codenamed Fox Hunt 2, Abbas was arrested alongside 11 others in six simultaneous raids. During the raids, detectives seized more than 150 million dirham, which is about $40 million in cash. Apart from that, there were 13 luxury cars that were worth about $7 million, 21 laptops, 47 smartphones, 15 memory storage devices, 5 external hard drives, and 800,000 emails of potential victims alongside a suitcase full of cash. The arrest was part of an FBI investigation that inducted Abbas 
as being a key player in a transnational cybercrime network that provided safe havens for stolen money around the world. In June 2020, the FBI sprang into action. The 38-year-old Abbas, known for flaunting his luxurious lifestyle on social media, was arrested in Dubai by special agents including the Emirati police officers and FBI operatives. After a month in the Emirati police custody, Abbas together with Olalekan Ponle, who is popularly known as Woodbury, were extradited to Chicago in the US in July 2020. It was in the US where Abbas would be tried. According to the FBI, Hashpapi was the leader of a mafia that facilitated computer intrusion, business email compromise fraud, and money laundering. The authorities say that Abbas and his gang targeted victims that were majorly in the US and duped them out of hundreds of millions of dollars. However, the US court in Illinois did not have jurisdiction over the case. Therefore, Abbas was transferred to Los Angeles, California, where the trial date was set. During the pre-trial services, Abbas pleaded not guilty to the four counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, money laundering conspiracies, international money laundering, and engaging in monetary transactions in property derived from specified unlawful activity. For the alleged fraud, Abbas was facing up to 20 years in U.S. federal prison if he was convicted. His trial date was set for 4th May 2020 by a United States District Court in California. The United States justice system is complicated and sometimes known to convict international criminals just to make a statement. To beat the serious charges leveled against him, Hashpapi needed an experienced lawyer cut for the cloth. He needed an attorney that understood international cybercrime laws and operations of BEC scams. The defendant was suffering from a psychiatric disease which prevented him from being able to tell the difference between right and wrong. One of such attorneys was Louis Shapiro. Defense attorney Lou Shapiro is a former public defender. In theory, uh, things like this can and should be pursued. Uh, but practically, LAPD is not going to pursue uh, cases where there's alleged misdemeanor domestic battery.